everybody doing today? The birds are singing. It's spring. It has sprung. Isn't that nice? So, I trust y'all had a good week. Anything unusual happened? And by unusual, I mean unusual. You know, like 57 Chevy drop in your yard or something, you know. No? Okay, good. We're good. Uh, y'all look pretty bright-eyed. There's a few of you that aren't so bushy-tailed, but uh, y'all look really good. Hey, we, it's been a great week. Uh, it's, it's, the weather's just encouraging, isn't it? And uh, we've gotten a little bit of rain, and that's what we've been praying for, you know. Our, people don't understand in other parts of the country, when you live in this part of the country, uh, rain is, is uh, well, it's necessary, obviously, but we don't get it as often as they do back east, you know. And so uh, when you pray for it and you get it, uh, you can't complain about it. But we do need to keep in prayer uh, our neighbors up in Nebraska, uh, you know, between the rains and the snow melt and everything else. I think somebody was telling me 95% of the Nebraska population is affected by the flooding. So uh, keep them in your prayers. And, uh, and I'm sure that they'd appreciate it. Uh, we're going to do some announcements, but I'm going to ask Rod to come forward and uh, give us an announcement, kind of update us on what's going on uh, with the conference. Other announcements. That was a long one, but other announcements are going to be shorter, I know. <laughs> Just a reminder that next Sunday after Sunday school, we're going to be having a shower for Tori and Amber. So come and uh, eat a hot dog with us and enjoy some time together. Anyone else? I'll draw your attention to the back of your bulletin, upcoming events, or coming events. Uh, and Wednesday, we have the Lenten breakfast right here. And it starts at 7 and ends at 7.30. And uh, you come on out. It's, it's usually a really good time, uh, at least from my perspective it is. Um, so come on out, be a part of that. I know that that might be early for some of you, but we'll still get you to work on time, okay? And if you don't believe that I will have you out at 7.30, come. Come and see. I believe that's what Andrew said to his brother. Come and see this thing. And uh, so that is my commitment is to get you out of here at 7.30. Uh, but it's, it's a lot of good food and uh, a good way to start. Uh, your Wednesday morning. And uh, April 7th, the Gideons will be here. And uh, and also, that's the Sunday where the, the Jerry um, Henderson is going to be here. And we're going to present uh, the check to the food bank that the uh, um, Beasties raised. And I guess we can tell the congregation uh, how much did we raise total, Kevin? Well, we raised, um, at just selling tickets for the, uh, the raffle, we raised $4,720. Okay. We had other donations given to us that helped us to do what we were doing. And so we, we, hold, we, we hold back a little seed money for next year's. But I think we're giving them a check of $4,500 $4, dollars to the food bank, and uh, and so that is a great gift. To them. And so uh, thanks again to all of you that made that possible. I have a thank you letter here from Alex Styles. It says thank you so much for welcoming me last week and letting me speak about my trip. Because of all your support, my mission trip to Cuba is now fully funded. In the last week of May, a team of 35 college students will be in Havana, Cuba, planting a church, doing community outreach, and just sharing our testimonies and love for Jesus. This wouldn't be possible without your support and all of your continued <coughs> prayers. 
Thank you all so much. I can't wait to come back and share with you all, of, with all of you, the amazing things God does during this trip. Thank you, Alex. Five. Super. All right. If there's no other announcements, I know that there's at least one birthday that's got to come up. There's probably more. Hey, right? there we go. short and sweet. All right. Well, congratulations. Happy birthday to you all. We, I, and I won't tell how old some of you are. It's really hard. Uh, how about anniversary? Hey, I knew we'd have at least one. How many years, Dan? 26. 26. All right. See, around here, I always ask the guys, because the women are watching and listening. You know, I think when I first started out here, it was like I'd ask the guy, and he'd, I don't know, a long time. <laughs> but uh, they caught on really well, so good going, guys. 26 years, Dan. Cool. Has it been tough, Dan? <laughs> Good, let's sing happy anniversary. Anybody else? Don't want to miss anybody. All right, let's sing happy anniversary. Happy anniversary. for what God has for us today, shall we? Some boast of their cars and some of their mansions, but we boast of the name of the Lord of hosts. 
Do not be impressed by the outward appearance of a person, for God does not see like we do, but looks into the heart. If anyone travels with Christ, there is a new creation. All the things are obsolete, all the things become new. Let us worship this God who looks into the human heart, and through Christ Jesus makes us all makes all things new. Amen. Amen. Good morning. Good morning, and welcome to All Need. It's good to see everyone. I just want to say thank you to Tina and to Jason um, for taking various things while I was gone. Last week we went to see, well, we had Zeke for three days without his grand, without his, his parents, and then we took them back um, to Belton, so we had to spend some time with them. But I always appreciate it when people step in and take over and do some things while I'm gone. Um, and speaking of, we have a guest guitarist. Good morning, Dakota. Oh, guest regular. Oh, guest regular. Okay. And Lynn is um, S and C. And Tristan is working on guessing. That. Anyway, it's good to see you. But thank you for coming. From Hebrews twelve twenty eight. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe.
Thank you so much for uh, the weather changing and bringing back the greenery that we can enjoy your beauty all over. Lord, thank you so much that we are able to come to your house and worship you. Lord, give us the need, the desperate feelings to want to know you, Lord. Lord, help us to uh, show the world how much we need you and love you, Lord, especially as the young ones are growing up in this church so that they can go out into the world and show their friends <coughs> and their families outside of this church how much you mean to them. Lord, in your name, amen. Children, please come up. <coughs> show us them. everybody? Yes. Did you get outside this weekend? Yes. How many were outside? Yay. I love to see that. It's so disappointing when somebody comes back to school on Monday and I ask them what they did and they say they were inside playing video games all weekend long. Oh, you have to have some outside time. You have to have some sun and some, some wind. See this right here? This helps this to work. There you go. Inquiring minds want to know. Speaking of inquiring minds, what is this I have in my hand? It's a Bible, and as Lucas was saying, do you hear what Lucas preached or prayed just then? About the little people coming to church. He was talking about all of you and how amazing it is to see all of you. And that our job as adults is to bring you up in the way of the Bible, what it has to say here. And so I hope your parents are reading to you from the Bible and other children's stories to help you understand what it means to be a Christian and how amazing that is. With that, I want to read a verse to you. It says, Isaiah 43, 2. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of, you, of Israel, your Savior. How many, you have, how many of you have things happen that sometimes it's just really, really difficult to um, just get up in the morning? Something happens, you just don't want to get up in the morning. Anybody ever have anything like that happen? No? You get up every morning and just say, here we go, it's going to be a great day. No. I was like, hey, today, today's your party. Well, it's okay. Right. Well, you know what? Everybody has things that happen that um, it makes it difficult to, to like go through the day. Things just happen and you just don't feel right for whatever reason. Have any of you been sick recently? Anybody here been sick? Recently, I know, I know that, yeah, I know that the senior health had some. Yeah, I think, yeah, that just puts you, yeah, being sick's no fun, is it? That isn't a gumball, sweetheart. You don't want that. <laughs> We'd be calling 911. What is that? Um, so, some of you have been sick. I know we've had a lot of illness at school. Kids have been sick. Have any of you had a test recently that you didn't do as well on even though you studied? 
Yeah, that, that's a bad deal, isn't it? Sometimes that just makes... Has anyone had any disagreement with your brother or your sister or your mom or your dad? The neighbors, the neighbors' kids, any of those kind of things? Yeah, anybody have any of your parents ask you to do something and you chose not to do it for whatever reason and your life got a little bit difficult right then? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I had some things happening at school this week that just made my week just go, oh! It, it, the ball is gone. Yeah, the ball is gone. Sometimes, yes. No, no. The ball's gone. Anyway, it is gone. And sometimes we feel like that. Sometimes things happen and we just get so buried under there that we just don't know what else we're going to do. And sometimes it just, it just goes and goes and goes. And things just happen. And we just feel like we are never going to get out of it. We are always going to be caught in this big old mess, things keep coming at us from all directions, and we don't know what we're going to be doing or how we're going to get out of it, but you know what? All of that time, wow. God has been with us. amen, give this to you. That is exactly right, God has been with us, and he's been putting people and things into our path to help us get over whatever is going on in our life. Keep that in your thoughts this week, okay? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for um, the kids and for what they mean to the church. Help us always to remember that you have our back, that you're always with us no matter what the situation is. In your son's name we pray, amen. Oh, little people first. <coughs> Oh, I know, little people first. There you go. Right. If you want to be a big person, just one thing. Just one thing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, you do, but not, not this time. Just one thing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Infants through four years can go down to the nursery, and kindergarten through fifth grade can go down to Children's Church in Belgium. Yeah. First off, I want to say that this church is just absolutely blessed. Financially, with people that are able to work, give, give up their hands, and most of all, most, uh, most definitely, we are blessed with children. This group is just growing leaps and bounds. It's just amazing. Lord, you have blessed us beyond belief. You have given over and over, Lord. Please accept our overwhelming blessings back to you as gifts, Lord. It's already yours. Use it as you will so that we can keep on growing and showing people your love.
this time we'll share some joys and concerns. Father, as Lucas said earlier, we are we are very blessed uh, by just your bountiful hand. You bless us. You blessed us with rain that we prayed for. You've given us uh, jobs and the ability to make a living. We have a friends and church home and Lord uh, we have your word but most importantly you've blessed us with your presence and we thank you for that and along with that as your children we have access to your throne room Lord I pray and ask that you would hear our prayers as we approach your throne Lord uh, bring comfort to all of Brenda's family as the passing of her uncle has grieved their spirits, no doubt. But we pray and ask that you would uh, wrap your loving arms around each one of them and make your presence known. Lord, we lift the burden before you and we pray and ask that all would go well with these pacemaker being put in. We want to trust you as the great physician for the outcome. And, uh, and we'll just... Uh, Lift him before your throne between now and then uh, to make sure that uh, we are dutiful in our friendship and in our brotherhood and sisterhood to learn lifting him in prayer. Lord, we are excited for Tori and Amber as their wedding approaches. Lord, uh, and Jeremy and Cassidy as their wedding approaches. Lord, these are exciting times for them and for their families and we pray and ask your blessing upon them lord may you be the center of their love for one another and may you be the center of their home as they establish it lord we we can't some of us begin to experience uh, the sense of loss um, when a fire ravages a home you lose all of those memories, all of your worldly possessions can be gone in a moment. And while we shouldn't focus on those possessions, Lord, they do become precious to us. The photos, the, uh, the gifts that were given to us and passed down through generations can be lost. And Lord, uh, it, can, it can be a hardship, no doubt not only financially, not only in the way of material, but Lord, spiritually and psychologically. It's a blow to the lives of those who experience it. We pray and ask that you be with this family who's lost their home. We pray and ask that you would minister to them through the community, Lord, through those uh, in your kingdom, Lord. We pray and ask that you would, uh, you would just take care of them now comfort them in their hour of loss as well. We lift Donna's before you and we pray and ask that as she goes in for uh, this, for her heart to be put back in rhythm uh, and to uh, we'll just pray that all would go well. That it would go well and uh, there would be no complications and, uh, and that uh, she would be back with Vern and, uh, in no time and, uh, and just Lord, help her to uh, know that your presence is with her. We ask that you would extend your healing hand upon her heart. Lord, uh, be with uh, Mr. McMahon. We pray and ask that you would be with him as he starts his cancer treatment. Lord, uh, it's a terrible disease, but we know that uh, you are the healer of terrible diseases. We look in the scriptures and we see what you did for those who, who uh, struggled with leprosy and all kinds of physical infirmity. We pray and ask that you would make your presence manifest in these situations, Lord, as the great physician. Lord, we lift Jackson and Wes before your throne, these little ones who uh, struggle each and every day with discomfort, uh, extreme, extreme skin condition with this eczema. It's not just a little bit, it's a lot. And, uh, and I know that it, it 
it takes its toll on them. They lose sleep. Uh, they can't lead the normal lives that little boys lead at this, at this point in their life. So we pray and ask that you would extend your hand of healing upon these little ones. Lord, that you would give the doctors wisdom as Katie takes them back to the physician. Lord, clear up whatever is going on in Jackson's lymph nodes. And Lord, uh, we pray and ask that you would help them to discover uh, his lack of growth. Lord, we pray and ask that you would uh, just be with both the boys. And, uh, and we believe that you're a God of miracles. I believe you, you're the God who parted the Red Sea. You're the God who raised Lazarus from the dead. And you are the God that can answer each and every one of these prayers to build our faith up for certain, but more importantly, to bring honor and glory to your holy name. And we pray and ask that you would do that. That be your will. Now we ask that you be with us throughout the rest of the service, Lord. Open our hearts to the truth of your word. And Lord, bless us greatly with your presence. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon us. And as we go throughout this week, help us to pray as you taught the disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. This time we have special music. I'm going to introduce Sue Peterson. Some of you probably got to know her. Uh, she has been a, not only a blessing to our church, but a blessing to my wife and I. She texts us every day with words of encouragement. And uh, and e every once in a while, even uh, even gets on the pastor about making a doctor's appointment for his foot. But, uh, <laughs> But she, uh, she's been a blessing, and she's going to bless us now with the song that the Lord's laid upon her heart. This is definitely one of my fa three favorite songs, and there's a lot of young people out there that I'm sure have never heard this song. It's called The Holy City, and it was written by Michael Maybrick over, uh, in England, and he has a, another name that he writes under, Stephen Adams. He was a composer and ironically a singer but wrote the music, and it became very, very popular, and back the most popular so uh, sacred song in England. The man who wrote the lyrics was also English. Interestingly, he wrote the song Danny Boy, and it was a flop in England, until his sister, who lived in our country, sent him the music to London Berry Air. He then took the lyrics to Danny Boy, put it with the London Mary Air tune, and the rest is history. Um, Pastor was kind to help me find the scriptures related to the Holy City. And unfortunately, I don't know Revelation very well, so he got me into Revelation. And um, Revelation is three, 12 says, Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out, and I will write upon him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God, and I will write upon him my new name. And then Revelations 21, 10. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of the heaven from God. Then in Psalms 135. Verse 21, Blessed be the Lord out of Zion, which dwelleth at Jerusalem. Praise ye the Lord. Oh 
deserves a big hand. With my spring allergies, she practiced with me four times. <laughs> and Miss Wanda Williams is just a miracle and a wonder for this church. Please stand for the reading of God's Word. Second Corinthians 5, 17 through 21. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ, and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Now God's people said. Amen. These guys are going to get my uh, whiteboard out for me. And uh, while they're doing that, let me just say it. What an incredible song. I love the song. Uh, what a day that will be when uh, we can be a part of that new Jerusalem. Amen. Uh, we often pray uh, in the Lord's Prayer, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. There, I believe there is a reflection of some things spiritually that go on. And so just as there is a city of, for the, uh, historically the city of Jerusalem has been the city of God since uh, the tabernacle or the temple was built. And so just as it is on earth, it is in heaven, and uh, and I look forward to that day when uh, I can walk through the gates, not only of uh, of the land that is fairer than my imagination can ever be, even begin to imagine, but, uh, but that I've become a part of that great city, and uh, I know you look forward to it too. Some days I look forward to it more than others, you know. I'm like, I got my ticket, God, I'm ready. <laughs> But uh, but it's a, a wonderful song, and Sue, you did a fantastic job. I, I can't hit those high notes. I can't sing a song like that, so appreciate those who can. We have been looking at this whole idea of sharing our faith. And, uh, and a few weeks ago, two weeks ago, I gave you, uh, I don't know if you keep these things or not. Some, I keep them. I have files of them. Uh, because I go back and it reminds me uh, what I need to be studying, what, where my thoughts need to be focusing. And uh, we, we did, when we started this, underst understanding what we're sharing when we're sharing our faith. We're sharing our part in God's story for our life and for the life of mankind. Jesus said in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, When power has come upon you, you shall be my witnesses. You, can't, you and I cannot witness anything to anything that we have not experienced ourselves. And so it's about our experience with God. And that's important. If we, yeah, that's why I gave the assignment. Now I got a few more in this week. Hey, don't need that. And uh, uh, I got a, cu uh, a couple by email, Lori, and uh, she's not here this morning, but uh, Jenny. Uh, and, uh, and so uh, it's important. The reason I gave that assignment isn't so much for me as it is for you. When's the, when and how often? When was the last time you told your story and how often do you tell it? And you can condense it, you can 
uh, wrap it up in any kind of package you want, but God will give you opportunity to share what He is doing in your life with other people. Not what just what He has done, but what He is doing. You see, it's not just past tense, how you came to know Him. It is also present tense of what He is currently doing in your life. That is the testimony of His reality. Because relationship we have with a real person. So these are a few things that I put up there this morning. Uh, I, I, excuse my penmanship, but I was rushed. Uh, your story, your story is imperative for being a witness. That's important. It's important, once again, not only for those who God is leading you to witness to on His behalf, but it's important for you. Why is it important for you to tell your story? Did I lose my microphone? I'm still, I still got a light. Why is it important for you to tell your story? Why is it important for you to know? Okay. She said it, you, you become more comfortable with it. And, and it becomes easier to tell that story, right? Uh, how many here have ever been asked how you and your spouse have met? <laughs> what, the rest of you have never? <laughs> <don't have> <laughs> <laughs> I can always count on you, Freddie. <laughs> The rest of you married folk, how's that? It was qualified. Yeah, people ask that at least once a year. You're with somebody, first time you meet, and my wife asked somebody last night. So how did you and your husband meet? And it's interesting to get the different perspectives. <laughs> That's right. Two sides to every page. <laughs> Julie, I love you. I love you, sister. I know you did. Two sides to every I like that. I'm going to use it again, and that will be a sermon illustration some point in the future. Okay? There are two sides to every pancake. And I, but just, just stop and think about it for a moment. When you tell that story of how you met, what are you doing when you tell that story? I tell the story, I tell stories about my wife all the time. People sometimes get sick of it, but, you know, who cares? I don't. You know why? Because every time I talk about my wife, how we met, what, what we've done, our experiences together, it rekindles, it keeps the flames of my passion to the surface of that relationship. Some of you walk out of here, you hear an illustration, and you say, Oh, that passion death, all he talks about is how many twice. That's okay, I'm okay with it. You can drive all the way home, eat your lunch, and complain about it. I mean, it doesn't matter to me. Because, listen, it keeps my passion for my wife in a vital and uh, point in my own personal walk with her. You will, you will never hear me refer to her as the ball and chain. Because that's not what she is to me. And so when we tell the, our story, our story of how we met Jesus, how He became real to us, how we entered into a relationship with Him, can you see how that relates just like keeping the passion? What are you most passionate about? What is it you like talking about? I've met guys who, when you mention cars, oh my goodness, you know, they'll tell you about cars. They can tell you about the engine, the size, I mean, uh, the compression of the engine, the piston cylinders, all that good stuff. You have opened a can of worms that you didn't know there were that many worms in that can. But they have a passion for it. 
and you pick up on their passion. And all of a sudden, you find yourself being a little bit more interested maybe in cars. Saying, wow, that, that's real. That, that is real. Whatever your passion is, hunting. There's guys who talk about hunting from the time the sun comes up until the time the sun goes down. And their wives are ready to just strangle them. There are guys that will not only talk about it, they'll watch the hunting channel, the pursuit channel, the outdoor channel, right, honey? Uh, <laughs> well, you, listen, everybody sitting in this room has passion about something. Passions that I can only appreciate about them. Kevin, he takes phenomenal pictures. You know, I look through a camera lens. I get my thumb. Everything comes out a little fuzzy. I don't know why that is. Maybe it's because I take my glasses off. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> but you can tell he's got a passion for it. And I appreciate it. I benefit from his passion for capturing what he sees in the beauty of nature. There are every one of you in this room have a passion about something. It can be sewing. It can be quilting for ladies. It can be reading. It can be studying. It can be politics. Oh boy, we ain't even going to go there. Uh, it, can, it can be uh, religion. It can be history. You talk to me. You don't get me started on history. I talk to you all day long. My wife, we were traveling one time up in Iowa. We left. And we were, I don't, I don't remember where we were going, but I started talking about history. I was talking about all the different wars and, and how that related to the day. And about two hours into it, she says, can we talk about something else? It's not that, this is not fascinating, but can we talk about something else? Do you have that same passion for your relationship with Jesus Christ? of how He came for you and me. How His cross was really ours. How He was willing through His love to lay down on our cross for our sin. He who knew no sin became sin for us. The thrill of knowing that because He rose from the grave and conquered death in the grave, that you and I can have the joy of knowing and the hope of eternal life. And people come to church every Sunday. Churches are filled all around the world with people who hear that story and it doesn't ignite and kindle the passion that we should have for God. And so your story is imperative if we're going to be effective witnesses. If we are going to change the world, and that's what God has chosen. We are His chosen instruments to change the world, to transform it. We bring, listen, you and I, when we enter a room, when we go to work, when we drive down the road, we bring with us the presence of Almighty God. It's imperative. If the world is to know the story of Jesus, it must be told by those who witnessed it. You say, well, I wasn't there when he died on the cross. Let's not go through this again. You were there. So was I. When he died on the cross, he looked through the eons of eternity and saw you and me. We were there. And one of the beautiful things is 
that we still experience the reality of Jesus Christ today. Because if the world is going to know the story, Jesus must be told by us, and it must be told from a perspective of reality. It's not what Jesus Christ did for me alone. It is what Jesus Christ is doing today in my life. You see, that's where people get a little squirrely about this thing. Because if it is just a, a, a rite of passage, if it is just the, the speaking of words, you remember, I don't know if any of you remember, we're in the Boy Scouts, the Cub Scouts, the Weeblows. I always liked that name. I was one day a Weeblow. <laughs> but I was a Cub Scout. Become a Cub Scout, you, you know, put your hand on your heart. I, it's been so many years. Uh, but you just recite the pledge, Cub Scout pledge, and you know you had a little salute. I wore the little blue cap with the yellow lines. I had a bear badge and a wolf badge, and I don't know what other badge. Lion, Lion yeah. Lion. Thanks, Fred. Thanks to the Eagle Scout there. So, but you take an oath and you join. You're part of it. That is, there are people who, I imagine, join all kinds of fraternities and they have to take some, go through some kind of ceremony. Listen, to be a member of the family of God, to be a follower of Jesus Christ, it is not about reciting an oath. It's not about reciting a creed. It's not about reciting anything. It is about confessing that you need a Savior, that I need a Savior. It is about the reality that I cannot do this on my own, that I need Him to transform my life into what He genuinely and initially created you and I to be. And so it's about confessing. If you believe in your heart, confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and that God, that He died on, on the cross for our sins and that God raised Him from the dead on the third day, then you will be saved. I like that. I like that. And here is what it boils down to. Is that each and every day, that relationship that I enter into now, that I have Him in my heart. We, well, that's, that's coming up, that time of the year. We only sing it at this time of the year. He lives. Isn't that a shame? Isn't it a shame we only sing uh, uh, Christmas songs at Christmas, but they have great, they have some great theology in them. And then we only sing Easter songs at Easter. Who made this rule? But one of my favorite songs is He Lives. He lives, He lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks to me along life's narrow way. He lives, He lives. Salvation, what? To impart. Now here's the catch. You ask me, how I know He lives, my story is imperative. You ask me how I know He lives, He lives within my heart. Do you see why your story needs to be a part of the narrative of Jesus Christ? Not because of what He just did at Calvary, but because of what He's doing in the transforming work of His life in your life today. And so, uh, our position in this whole thing, Paul writes and says, and, and, and uh, Lucas read it in verse 20, Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Do you realize the weightiness of that statement? What is an ambassador? Someone who represents. Who represents. We have ambassadors. The United States have ambassadors all over the world. They speak out. They speak out. 
They have representation. We have representation in the countries around the world. When I was in Suriname, I forget what year it was, 2001, I, I spent New Year's, uh, no, no, not New Year's, Super Bowl. I watched Super Bowl in Suriname from the U.S. Embassy with Marine Guards. That was fun. What an experience. You know, it was a great time. There are a few other guys there, too. You know, glasses, black suits. But anyway, they had, they had an ambassador. I didn't get to meet the ambassador. I just met the Marine Guard. But I thought it was cool being in the embassy. We have a, a presence there. If you were to get in trouble in a foreign country, uh, if you needed help, where do you go? You go to the embassy. The ambassadors represent the government of the United States. They represent the president of the United States. And so they are the representatives. We are his ambassadors. Now look at what it says. It's not just that we represent, but it says now we are ambassadors for Christ as though God were pleading through us. What does that say to you? That this job as an ambassador isn't just to put on a front. It's not just to put our best foot forward and say, look, I'm a Christian. See how I dress? See how I go to church on Sunday? See how I carry my Bible just right underneath my arm? It's not about the appearance. It's not about pomp and circumstance. Paul says it is about a sense of urgency as though we are, he is pleading to people through our lives. Stop and think about it. Who are you willing to give up to the fires of hell? Who are you willing to give up to being lost for all eternity? You make a list? That's probably kind of heavy, isn't it? Because if there's not a sense of urgency that we want others to know the joy of salvation, that's what we're doing. If we let Satan shut us down with fear, that's what we're doing. Think about your family members. You don't have to be pushy. You don't have to be uh, 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 offensive. All you have to do is love them with the love of Christ. My mother, you guys know, she prayed for my father every night. When I was a young boy, there were times when I would hear her praying. My mother had her place. You know, I don't know about how all of you guys were growing up. My mother had her rocking chair. My dad had his recliner. And there was a table in between the two. And there was another table on that side of the chair and another table on that side of the chair. My dad kept his radio on that side of the chair. So this is country music. My mother kept her sewing and her Bible on this side of the chair. In, and in the middle, they kept peanuts. <laughs> I've kind of taken that as a rule. Peanuts are always good in the house. But I can remember walking in as a child and seeing my mother with her worn Bible and her little notepad writing things. And I was always curious. What was it she was writing? And she, I so, thought, you know, not that she would have minded, but I thought, well, she's got something she's writing down. I want to see if she's writing down something about her youngest son. Go over there and open it up. Most of it were promises that she was finding in the scriptures. My mama prayed every night, every morning for my father to come to know Jesus because she was not willing to give him up to the fires of hell. She was not willing to give him up for all eternity. <clears throat> There's a song that reminds me of that kind of love, the love of Christ. Why did she love him so? Well, they had gone through a lot together, but that love grew because of her love for Jesus. My mother wasn't always a Christian woman. 
She could have very easily have left my father. He put her through a hell sometimes. And she dished it back. But when she came to know Christ, she was not willing to give him up for all eternity. Why? Because of the love of God. If that isn't love, the oceans are dry. If that isn't love, there are no stars in the sky. The lyrics of a song that tells how God loved us so much that He left the splendor of heaven knowing that destiny was Calvary. Knowing the penalty was being the sacrifice for our sin. And yet He came voluntarily. If that isn't love, I don't know what is. And when you and I invite Him into our life and into our heart, that love that He is, that is what the Gospel, John writes in his first epistle, God is love. He is not just loving. He is love. And when He comes into our heart, He brings Himself, which is love, into us. And that love begins to grow and nurture. And so we can look at people, even if we don't agree with their lifestyle, even if they have sin in their life that, that we don't agree with, even if they are doing things that, that we don't condone. It doesn't matter because we look at them and we see them not as the enemy, but we begin to see them as people caught up in the casualty of sin in their life. And we begin to look at them with the eyes of Jesus Christ, the eyes of compassion. The only one that you and I should be upset with and have a, a animosity toward is Satan. Let me end with this for you to think about. Satan's tactic to combat the gospel from being spread by you and me into other people's lives to neutralize our witness is isolation and the dissolution of relationships. We live in a time that is touted as a time of great connectivity. About everybody in here, not everybody, but about everybody in here has a Facebook page, has a Twitter account, is on Instagram, is on Twitter, is on email. What's it? Snapchat. Snapchat. I don't even know what that is. That sounds like something that hurt you. Uh, <laughs> We have email. We have all of these things. And they say we are the most connected generation that's ever walked the face of the planet. Except we are isolated because you don't have relationships through Snapchat and Instagram and Twitter and Facebook. You do not build relationships. You cannot have conversation in those, in those mediums. Let me tell you how you have a relationship. How's your week been going, Manny? Pretty good? Yeah. You cold? Always. <laughs> Always. <laughs> we might be connected informationally, but we are isolated relationally. When's the last time you have put down your phone and you just spent time talking with somebody? In a world where we are connected for information, we are isolated in relationships. You know what? Facebook can't put their arm around me when I'm going through a rough time and let me weep on their shoulder. Facebook, people might be able to type in, we're praying, and that's good, don't get me wrong. And it can be comforting. But it is nothing compared to somebody coming up 
and grabbing your hands and saying, I'm praying for you and your family in their loss. They can't hear the brokenness in your tone. They can't feel the human warmth radiating from your body into theirs. We have become relationally isolated. And so he neutralizes, Satan neutralizes our witness to the gospel by isolating us relationally. And we've got to turn that around. We've got to turn it around, folks. Luke chapter 14. Jesus tells the disciples a parable of the Great Supper and how the, the host, the Master, has prepared a great supper, a great feast for those who would come in to sup with Him. For those of his that were to be known as His friends. And when the time of the banquet arrives, what happens is the hall is empty and the master comes in and says where are all my guests and one says well uh, I have to go somewhere I have business to tend to another one says well I have family coming in and I need to take care of my parents and the other one says uh, I've got business and other things to take care of and what it boils down to is they have other people to love they have other things to do and they have other places to go and the master says I have prepared this great feast for them and he tells his servants to go out into the highways and the byways find somebody who will come in and appreciate what I've provided for them and he tells them this go out and compel them to come in even after they've gone out and they brought people into the great feast and the master says to the servants, is the hall full? No, there's still room for more. Then go find more. They go out and find more. Is the hall full? No, there's still room for more. Go find more. Compel them to come in. I want to provide for those who appreciate what I have done. And that is what God cries out to His church today. I close with this. And I ask you, to, you just stand with me. I know I preach long, but I always preach long. You gotta know. I used to sing a song, and the words went like this: "The course, my house is full, but my field is empty. Who will go and work for me today? It seems my children all want to stay around at their tables, but no one wants to work in my field." The harvest is white. You and I don't need a combine. We don't even need a grain trailer to run behind it. All you and I need is a sense of urgency to tell our story about what Jesus has done in our life. That is our sickle. Don't let Satan neutralize what God's called you to be. An ambassador for Him with a sense of urgency for those to be reconciled to Him. Father, I thank You for the truth of Your Word. It is sometimes difficult to, to, for me to put all that You lay upon my heart into just a few moments. But I pray and ask that You would rise up within us, that Your Spirit would begin to burn mightily within us. That we would have an urgency uh, to share the love that You have shown to us. Help us to share that love for others. It doesn't matter what their station in life. It doesn't matter what what their sin they're caught up in. We have all sinned and come short of Your glory. Lord, we just want to see them come to know You, to experience the, the saving grace that can only come from You. We do not want them to experience the wages of their sin because Your Word says that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. There is nothing that they have to do except, except You. 
to accept the gift of eternal life. Lord, I pray and ask that You would give us a sense of urgency for those that we work with, for those in our families, for those that we live next to, for those that we stand in behind uh, at Walmart and Carlson's. Lord, we just need to be radiating Your presence. A smile on our face uh, can go a long way to starting to melt the walls of isolation that the enemy has gripped a world in. Lord, help us to be relational. Help us to build friendships and relationships. And Lord, help us not to be afraid to have that conversation. It doesn't have to be rehearsed. All it has to be is, you know what? My life was totally different until I met Jesus. Lord, give us a sense of urgency. Help us to be willing like the servants in Luke chapter 14, to be willing to go out and compel them to come in to the great feast and the great banquet that you've provided for all people. You would that all men be saved, but that is their choice. We pray and ask that you would help us to just be vessels of your love. And we ask this in Christ's name, amen. This is not in your hymn book. Wanda found that out, so Tori. We'll just sing the first verse and the chorus, Wanda. Can we start with the chorus? Okay, let's start with the chorus and then we'll go to the first verse and then we'll sing the chorus again and then we'll close. Here we go. who needed to be brought in from the fields of sin. Somebody saw fit to make their pursuit of my life a sense of urgency for them. And I thank the Lord for that. You and I make a difference in the world. We've been put in the place that we've been put for a reason. And it's to bring honor and glory to God and to share the story of Jesus and to compel others to come to Him. The Lord bless you and keep you. His peace be upon you. And may you experience the joy of the Lord and the blessings of salvation as you walk this week with Him. And all God's people said, Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.